All right, I'm looking to the side because the Schedule C is over here on this monitor. So we are going to go through. And first of all, I just want to say, if you are using a CPA or a tax preparer, or if you're doing taxes on your own through a program like TurboTax or H&R Block or Free Tax USA or whatever, you're going through an interview-based process. So you don't have to go through and fill out this form like in the old days where you have to go through the instructions and say, okay, now add this amount to this amount. It's largely going to be automated and it's going to it's going to ask you for inputs and then it's going to calculate the output. So we're kind of going to be doing a hybrid. We'll be doing both. So let's let's just do an example. Let's say you are um so so this is the form you will will fill out slash will be filled out or populated if you are a sole proprietor, which is what you are to by default, or if you're a single member LLC. So I'll just put my name here. Uh, you'll put your social in here. These fields aren't all necessarily that important. You could leave A and C blank if you want. Uh, the business code doesn't matter a whole lot. So this is the one I have used for years and years is this 454110, electronic shopping. They have they add new codes and stuff. So this one might not even work anymore with certain softwares. So then you might just have to choose a different one, but um, it's going to be four or five something but doesn't matter. You could even leave a blank. It's just informational. Um, if you leave this blank, it's just going to default or pull from your individual address. Did you materially... Again, these are just information. The boxes don't matter all that much. Like, did you participate? Yes. Did you start it in 2023? No, I'll leave that blank. Um, so this one, if you made any payments that would require you to file a form 1099, that means did you did you give any contractors or freelancers over six hundred dollars during the year? If you say yes, um, then that means you should have sent them a 1099. So if you say yes here, I did, but then say no, then I mean I haven't seen this happen a lot necessarily, but in theory you're just basically telling them that I should have done this, but I didn't do it. So, you know, you can find me basically. So, so you have a couple options. You could either, um, or if this is no, then you have, you don't have to fill this one out, but if this is yes and you didn't do it, you can file it late. Um, you can put file it late and put yes, or you can put no, I didn't file it and just see if they ever contact you. Um, Okay, so gross receipts. This is where you put your gross sales, basically. So let's say you had 10,000 of sales, um, and that's before refunds, because on the refunds I put right here, let's say I had $500 worth of refunds. And then my net sales is this 9,500. And before I go on, let me just say, okay, what if my gross sales were 10,000 but Amazon or eBay, they sent me a 1099K that says 12,000. And I'm like, why don't they match? They're never going to match. I've never seen a 1099 match um, you know, what your Amazon sales report says or what your own records say. And almost always the 1099s are inflated because they, they can... With, some platform 1099s include sales tax. That's the case for Amazon. Um, they include sales for inventory or sales that were refunded. So if my 1099 is 12,000 and I report 10,000, the IRS is going to send me a letter in a, in a year or maybe two, and they're going to say, hey, you underreported your sales. So you owe us more tax. So in order to avoid that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to match the 1099. 
So I'm going to put 12,000 here. Now my sales are inflated by 2,000 on here. But what I'm also going to do is add 2,000 more to the refunds. Or if I know it was for taxes, I'm going to put it down here, 2,000. So I'm subtracting it back out. So this does two things. It satisfies the IRS computers. It doesn't cause any flags because your gross sales matches what they have on record. And um, it doesn't affect your net income or your taxable net income because you're subtracting it back out for tax purposes. Okay, so on line four, you enter your cost of goods sold. And I've got a YouTube video on this that, that I link in my personal tax preparation instructions because I want people to understand if they're using the accrual method or the cash method. So they want you to fill that out on this part three, page two of the Schedule C. So let's use uh, Daniel's example. He said that his CPA said, the beginning inventory needs to match your prior year ending inventory. So if this were the 2022 form and my inventory said 2000, mm, let's do 2500, then the beginning inventory for 2023 is 2500. Um, and typically, it'll just use cost. Um, and your purchases, that's simply the cost of everything you purchased during 2023. So let's say you purchased $8,000 worth of inventory. Okay. So between what you started with and I think you can see my calculator. I'm not sure though. Between what you started with and what you purchased, your inventory is up to 10500 So do you get to deduct all that? No, it depends on what your ending inventory was, because whatever you have on hand at the end of the year, that's what you don't get to deduct. So you have to subtract that out. So let's say you have 3,000 ending inventory, December 20, December 31st, you have to subtract out that amount because you haven't sold it yet. So that leaves you with 7,500. So ending inventory goes right here. And then that's the math problem that it does. It does 2,500 beginning plus 8,000 purchases minus your ending is what you can deduct. So you're basically saying, I can deduct all of this, but I have to subtract out what didn't sell. And this is if you're using the accrual method for inventory. And that has nothing to do with this box right here that I'm just realizing now that I skipped. The accounting method for almost all small businesses is typically gonna be cash. That refers to everything except for inventory. This does not refer to inventory. It typically refers more to how you record your sales. So now let's pretend you're using the cash method for inventory where you just deduct everything you purchase in that case, this form is not really built for that. It's built for the accrual method. So you kind of have to do a workaround. And that workaround is you just don't list a beginning or ending inventory. You don't list a beginning because the beginning stuff would have already been deducted in a prior year. So the 8,000 purchases is simply going to flow down to the cost of goods sold line. And then it's going to go up here. But let's not use 8,000, let's use um, 3,000. Okay, so you've got your net sales minus your cost of goods sold, which gives you what's called your gross profit, which is gonna be 6,500. Other income, often you won't have this. It's, this is gonna be like things that aren't necessarily a part of your day-to-day -day business, like it might be, um, I don't know, credit card, cash back, or, and this is where the instructions come in handy because you can go in there and look at examples. So like this weird stuff that you typically wouldn't have. So gross income, 6,500. Uh, and I'm going to go a little quicker through these expenses. 
Uh, but advertising, you may or may not have car and truck expenses. So this is where you can use either the mileage method or the actual expenses method. And for 2023, you get 65 and a half cents per business mile, or you can deduct the business portion of your actual expenses, which include your, your gas, your maintenance, insurance, and depreciation. And if you look on page two, um, this part four has to do with the vehicle. So let's say I got a new vehicle that I put into business use at the beginning of 2023. Let's say I drove a thousand miles, total of 2000 miles. And this is on the, a lot lower than what I see most of my clients have. So we're going to assume that we're using the mileage method. So a thousand miles, 65 and a half cents per mile, I think is. Nope. I think that's it. Um, did you pay someone a commission or fee? Did you have contract labor? Let's say you um, had someone help you list or something. Let's say $1,000. Depletion typically won't have that. Depreciation, um, not unless you have some type of property or fixed asset, you know, equipment or something that's over $2,500. You probably won't have employee benefit programs. This would be more common if you have um, an LLC or an S Corp or employees. Any kind of liability insurance would go here. Not health insurance, not personal stuff. Credit card interest could go here. If you have some type of business mortgage, you could put that here. Legal and professional, that could be accounting attorney fees, um, the business portion of your tax preparation. So if you pay 500 bucks for your taxes and they did a Schedule C, um, you could say, well, I'm going to say 250 that was for the business Schedule C portion. Office expense, pension and rent are less common, but vehicles, yeah, this is rent as well. Well, for rent, you might have, you might rent a storage unit. Maybe you rent a warehouse, that would go here. Repairs and maintenance. Um, supplies is often a big one that I fill out for resellers. Travel and meals is another one. Those would go here. Utilities. This is typically where I would put your the business portion of your cell phone and internet. Or if you have a, a separate business warehouse or something, you would put those utilities here. This is not for your personal utilities for like a home office. Those would be part of... The home office deduction, which is um, this line. Wages, this is only if you have employees. You don't want to be, you shouldn't be paying yourself a wage. Uh, you take distributions as a business owner. And, and as I'm going through this, I'm realizing like we could dive deep into any one of these areas. So I'm really kind of water skiing over this right now. One of the main questions is, well, I don't see, uh, people say, I don't see a, a business a uh, field or line, an expense line for all of my different expenses. And that's really common. Like this is not inclusive at all. So typically the, the majority of your expenses are going to go on this other column right here. And those are all separately listed out by you. And those are, those are broken out down here below in this part five. So this is typically where I would put eBay fees, um, Amazon fees, and you don't have to break them out. I mean, the IRS likes more detail than less, but I think putting them all as platform fees is fine. I break them out just for fun. Shipping fees, those are pretty significant. So any software would typically go here. Um, education and training. And I'm just listing the ones that are the biggest that I can remember off the top of my head that I often put in here. Um, subscriptions. What else? What else? If it, if it doesn't fit in any of the categories above, we'll just say a thousand. So that thousand carries up to this amount. And I guess we can add these up just for fun. 3,000, 4,000. 
plus 250 plus 655. So that's 4905 total expenses. So if you use the simplified home office deduction, first of all, you can use the home office deduction if you have a space in your home that you use regularly and exclusively for the business. And you can get a max of 300 square feet and you get $505 per square foot. Let's see, enter the total square footage and the part of your home used for business. The part of your home used for business. Oh yeah, I got it backwards. So let's say 300, let's say my home is 15, maybe it's an apartment, 1500 square feet. Let's do 2000. Anyway, I only get a max of $305 per square foot. So that's 1500. So that gives me 3405 net profit. If you use the regular home office deduction method, that's calculated. These won't be filled out, but this number will be, and that's calculated on form 8829. And that's where you factor in your rent or mortgage interest and property taxes and utilities. Um, Daniel says, for cell phone, can I deduct the whole bill in utilities? So yeah, up here, you can deduct the whole bill if it's 100% used for business. So anyway, here is your net profit. 3405. And that carries to what's called the Schedule 1. And from there, that carries to the 1040. And I'll just show you where. So that will carry to here, line eight. So 3405. So that's going to be added to your W 2 income, to any interest. And it's going to be added to yield your total income on line nine. Um, which might which might have a deduction. Yeah, it just goes from there. You take out the standard deduction, and then from there it calculates your income tax and your self-employment tax and all that fun stuff. So if, if you have any questions on any of these categories that, that we went through on here, just let me know. Um, yeah, and Stacy, if, if I'm doing your taxes, I'm happy to go through this with you. And oftentimes, if anybody wants to go through their tax return with me, uh, once I've completed it, I'll just first record a video just going through line by line like we did, only it's already filled out. Um, Karen has a question. So I, she says, I just purchased a backyard shed and also use part of my home for business. How would that be handled? So the shed would typically be factored separately aside from the home office deduction. And it's going to depend on if it is um, fixed, like if it's, if it's mobile or if it's actually a fixed structure that's, you know, bolted down or has a foundation or whatever, because if it is a fixed structure, that's going to lean more toward being, um, what do you call it? Like, real property that has to be depreciated over 39 years or something. Um, if it's more mobile, it's more of like a supplies expense. And sheds are a little bit, yeah, it could be five years. It could be seven years. It could be, if it's less than $2,500, you could just deduct the whole thing. So that one, I'm, I don't have a specific answer for that one because it just depends. Sheds are uh, kind of a gray area. Julie says we use TurboTax, but I would like to see if the actual, but I would like to see the actual calculating forms, such as the 8829 you mentioned. Yeah, that's the thing with TurboTax is like that's that's how I am too. I'm like, I answer the questions and then it spits out the forms, but I want to see how everything is actually being calculated. For the most part, the stuff on this, well, I mean, the cost of goods sold, the mileage. The other expenses can all be seen on page two of the Schedule C. The 8829 form. So TurboTax, I mean, when it spits out your forms, it should show you the 8829. 
So I won't go through this in detail right now, but at the top it says, okay, what's the square footage of the office? What's the square footage of the whole home? Okay, it's 20%. Okay, let's multiply 20% times um, your real estate taxes, your mortgage interest, repairs, rent, utilities, and we can include some depreciation if you own the home. And here's your total home office deduction. And that carries forward to the Schedule C. Um, so what other forms would be helpful to reference? As far as the business, I mean, if you do have depreciation, there's going to be a depreciation worksheet that shows the detail. I think that's mostly going to be it. Uh, Ross says, can you write off the cost of your CPA? Yes. So let's say he or she does your taxes and they say it's $500. That's where I got this 250. They, they probably won't break out the personal versus the business portion. You could ask them to, but I think that's just a waste of time. You should just, you could do that yourself. <clears throat> um, if, if you, if you have lots of schedules, if you have a schedule A, if you have a schedule B, if you have a schedule E for rental, like if you have a lot of different forms, then maybe the business portion is going to be less. If you have a W-2 and a Schedule C, then they probably spent the bulk of their time on the Schedule C. So you could say, well, I'm going to say 75% or 50% is the cost of the CPA. So I took 50% and put 250 here. So that's where I'm deducting um, the tax prep fee. If you had bookkeeping fee, that's 100% deductible. You could add that there. Uh, Brandy says, if paying a minor child for work, do I pay tax on that? How about other fees like Social Security, Medicare? So this is one I like talking about. I think we touched on this last time and maybe, maybe even the time before, but if you pay a child, your child under who's under 18, you want to have them as an employee because your children employees are not, their wages are not subject to Social Security and Medicare. So if you pay them, let's let's say you paid them $10,000, you can put that all here. You get a deduction for that. Um, it's not subject to payroll tax for them. And they don't have to file income taxes either because that's all going to be wiped out by the standard deduction, which is like $14,000. So it's a pretty sweet deal. You get to reduce your taxes by $10,000. So let's see what that does for us. So that actually puts you at a loss. Okay, so when you have a loss, you actually can't take the home office deduction. So I had to back that out. But putting in that $10,000 for your kids, 5095, flips you over into a loss. So you have a taxable loss, which is going to reduce your overall income it's if you have w2 income here it's going to reduce that down to 4000 taxable income um but you got to keep that money in the family it was never taxed to your kids so it's it's a pretty good strategy uh the age requirement on that is younger than 18 can they work if they're that young most states have an exception if it's your own kids, like they're not subject to the same Department of Labor rules. But again, if you want to use your your toddler or your baby for photography, or even if you have them labeling stuff, like I had my three-year-old labeling my Amazon products. Um, I've never I've never seen a Department of Labor come after anybody for that. The IRS doesn't care. That's more of a state thing. Best way to track that. So since you're not paying, since their wages are not subject to Social Security, Medicare, you don't even have to put them on payroll. That's the main purpose of a W-2 so the government can see how much was withheld. Uh, but nothing's being withheld because you don't have to pay those. So I, I don't think you should necessarily set up a payroll for them just for that. I would just keep your own bookkeeping records. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Um, you can't, you can't go back and 
you can't typically make retroactive payroll payments. Um, I mean, I've seen people kind of do it. You can kind of try and do a workaround. Like if you took money out of the business, so if you took a distribution, let's say for yourself, you could you could reclassify that distribution because it already happened in the appropriate year. And you could say, well, that was for my child. So you could kind of get away with it that way. At least I wouldn't be opposed to doing it that way. So I think I'm caught up. So that's the Schedule C. It flows to the 1040, which is where your taxes are calculated. So I just want to touch real quickly on these other two forms, the 1065 and the 1120S. I know these will be easy to tune out, but I said in the beginning, if you are a sole proprietorship or a single member LLC, this is the form the IRS has you fill out. And it's just part of your 1040. It's another schedule of your main tax form, which is this one. If you are a multi-member LLC or a general partnership, which is like the multi-member version of a sole proprietorship, it's just two people who say, hey, let's be a partnership. Let's get an EIN. That's it. You, there's no formal formation other than that. General partnership or multi-member LLC, you would fill out I mean, you're not going to be filling it out. Again, it's going to be an interview-based process or somebody's going to be doing it for you. Uh, but you'll have to complete or have completed a Form 1065. And I'm going to go over this one really quickly. It's it's the same kind of thing. You're basically taking your profit and loss report and putting it on this form. So line one, just like the Schedule C, like this is almost the same thing. Gross receipts, cost of goods sold, Um and there's a lot of stuff that doesn't apply, like farmers get their own line. So you don't have to worry about that. So total income, salaries and wages other than to partners, because even as a partnership, you're not supposed to take a salary. You're just supposed to take distributions. Um, yeah, most of this stuff doesn't apply in most cases. Most of it's going to be detailed separately on this other deductions line which goes on a whole other form, just like page two of the Schedule C. Um, so that's all I'm really going to cover there. So you got to answer a bunch of questions. Sometimes if you have over 250,000, I feel like a, I feel like I may be going way too deep. If you have over $250,000 in sales, you're required to fill out a balance sheet. So it's another reason to keep good books. Um, and there's all this reconciliation stuff. But anyway, ultimately, this, uh, where is it? Total income. This number, let's say it's 20,000, goes on a K-1 form, which is part of the 1065. The K-1 is sort of like a W-2 because the, the business has to give that form to the individual. And then the individual takes the amount from the K-1 and lists it on their 1040 so it can be taxed. So the, the partnership is not itself taxed. This is an informational form only. And the un income, the profit, flows through to your individual tax return. So that's also the case with the form that S-Corps have to fill out. This one is really similar to the 1065 that we just looked at. Same kind of thing. So going back to the kids helping real quick. So the question is, do, do checks, do checks would be hours wage only since you don't have to do tax? Um, yeah, you can pay hourly if that's what you're asking. My kids help out all the time, but I don't understand this right off. So I just end up paying them or buying them something in exchange. Yeah, just make it a, a, a transfer from your business account to the child's bank account. And then you have a paper trail. And if you're using a bookkeeping software, that's going to be in that transfer is going to be imported. And you'll just classify that as wages 
which are deductible to the business. So Brandy says, if trying to lower taxable income, is there anything else that has a grace period, so to speak? Um, like an IRA, income wound up being quite a bit more than I thought. Yeah. So if, if you've done, and I have clients that that's the case with, so they come in and they say, wow, I owe $10,000. I did not expect to owe that much. Is there anything else I can do to lower it at this point? And sometimes that's just an expense from 2023 that they didn't find that we can add in. But there are also things you can do now in 2024 that will can potentially lower your 2023 taxes. So, and I can't think of a ton, but so if you have a business and if you already have uh, like a a SEP IRA set up, you can contribute to that. You can contribute to an IRA up until the tax deadline to reduce that that can be counted toward your 2023 taxes. Um, I think you can SEP IRA, like they're simple, like there's all these different retirement plans and a lot of them have that kind of grace period that goes up until the, the tax deadline. Some of them, the plan has to be already set up before the end of the year. And I think there might be one of those or two of those that you can actually set the plan up now but I don't know off the top of my head. I'm trying to think of what other items. I mean, you can look at, are you using the most effective, the most beneficial method of my mileage versus, you know, vehicle expenses, the most effective method for home office. Um, Like sometimes people are paying their kids, but they're not deducting it on their taxes. So I'll have to, that's when I would have to do more research on to jog my memory. But yeah, the, where I would start is looking into different retirement vehicles. Uh, Julie says, would a general partnership be beneficial for a husband wife team so that both show social security income? Yeah, and this is really common. She says, our eBay is in my husband's name, so he's the only one who shows income for that work. I show no income from eBay. Yeah, so look at, oh, I'm still sharing my screen. So if you look at this Schedule C, this, I don't, yeah, it's either going to be your name or your spouse's name on here. So what you can do as a married couple, if you both want credit, so so let's say this number was actually still uh, a profit, let's say 5,000 positive. So this is all going to go to me. If I wanted my wife to get credit for half of this, you can do what's called a qualified joint venture. Um, and that's basically just splitting all these amounts in half and creating two Schedule Cs, and then you'll each get 2,500. You could do a general partnership, but I think that's overkill. Like, why pay, you know, five, six, seven, eight hundred bucks to have someone fill out this form for you? If all you want is to get credit, you could do that. Or another thing you could do is you could say, oh, okay, five thousand profit. I'm gonna pay my spouse as a contractor. So I'm gonna pay them twenty five hundred. That'll change this to 2,500. And then the spouse can fill out their own Schedule C. And all they're going to do is list income of 2,500 right here with no expenses. So there's a, a few ways you can do it. Um, Jess says, do red flags go off if the IRS to the IRS if you show multiple years of negative taxable income? Um, not typically. So it's it's pretty common for people to have losses multiple years in a row. Um, that's not going to raise any flags. If I had 12,000 of income here and I said, you know what? I bought 
three cars. So I'm going to claim $150,000 expense. And that's going to give me like, you know, whatever the math is, $145,000 loss. So yeah, that's a red flag. But like a, a regular loss within normal bounds, even for 10 years in a row, it's not going to raise any flags. There is a rule that that says, okay, the, the IRS says, if you have a loss three out of the last five years, we can take a look. And if we think it's not a real business, we can reclassify it to a hobby. And that means we're going to disallow a bunch of the deductions because because hobbies can't deduct the same things that businesses can deduct. But if you can show that it is a business, then um, there's no risk. And it's not hard to show your business. You can say, look, here's my business bank account. Here's my bookkeeping. Here's all the stuff I do every day. Um, so if if I do your taxes, you can get with us after you do them to see if there's an option. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I always send out a draft before along with the invoice. And I say, here's your tax turn. You know, take a look. If you want to go through it together, let me know. Some people are like, some people have been with me for years and they know the drill and they're like, nope, it's good. File it. Other people are like, uh, yeah, I'd like to go through it. Or, you know, let's talk about it and see if there's anything else you can do. And typically if I see something obvious that you can do, I'll bring it to your attention. But sometimes I don't know what I don't know. Like I don't, I don't have always have access to your bookkeeping records. So I don't know if there's a big, you know, repairs and maintenance charge that we should have included that we didn't. Um, but if if I see you're an Amazon seller and you made 50,000, but you didn't give me any Amazon fees or shipping, and this just happened to me this past week, I'll reach out and say, hey, did you have any eBay fees? And the guy was like, oh yeah, shoot, I can't believe I didn't give you that, that $30,000. If I don't plan to grow in the future, do you recommend using the cash method for inventory? Um, yeah, probably if your goal is not to grow and you just want a store to stay steady, it's a hobby that you enjoy, or maybe you're planning to, to, you know, eventually close it down. I'd probably just do the cash method of inventory because it's simpler. Just, you don't have to worry about beginning or ending inventory. You're valuing that. Whoops. This should have been 3000, by the way. Um, you'll just enter your total purchases. Do you have a good resource to learn about the ones you can set up now? Are there any benefits to hiring a parent who has already retired? Let's see, good resource to learn about the, the what that could be set up now, Daniel. Um, benefits to hiring a parent who has retired. Tax benefits, they, they don't have the same tax benefits as the kids, like they're their wages would still be subject to Social Security and Medicare. So you might as well have them as a contractor. And they're subject to self-employment tax, but then but you're not having to pay it. They would pay it in that case. Um, I would have to double check, but off the top of my head, there's no like significant benefits for taxes. I mean, it, it could benefit your relationship, maybe, you know, if they could use that income or if, you know, they're like, Glad you're giving them something to do. It just depends. Uh, we recently moved and where our internet is in our house doesn't allow for a good connection in my office. If I have to buy a router, is this full business expense or do I have to split it? Okay. I know I, know I read that all jumbled, but I know what you're asking. So if you look at this form 8829, so this is where it shows the calculation of your home office deduction. You can see that there's this direct expenses column and this indirect expenses column. Typically, the one that's more heavily used is the indirect expenses. So let's say you're in an apartment and your rent is 24,000 a year. Your utilities are, I don't know, 3,000. So it's going to say, okay, 20% of 27,000 is $5,400. That's your home office deduction. Um, but if you purchased some, like if you have a, 
expenses that are, are directly related to your home office, you would put them in this column and you would get the full amount and it would not multiply it by this percentage. I paused there because I was thinking like for the router, if it's specifically for your office, you wouldn't even have to include it on this form. You could just deduct it as like supplies expense just right here on the Schedule C. So a direct 100% deduction. Um, the exception to like, if if you bought it because your home office, but you're still using it in the rest of your home, then you still would have to split it out. So Julie says, at what sales dollar amount should one convert from cash inventory to accrual? I mean, you can start with the accrual method from the beginning, but if you started with cash, which a lot of people do, and you want to um, switch over, uh, there's not a dollar amount. It's it's the it's what has historically been required. I think the IRS. It's more black and white. Um, it's probably what the IRS is more used to. That said, there's nothing to get uh, wrong with using the cash method. Um, I would say like, I don't know, once you're up up into the 100,000, 200,000 sales, I would start thinking about it. it. And it depends if you're doing the if you're doing bookkeeping, that's when I would think about it because um it allows you to it for me it makes your books make a little more sense because let's say I, I purchase all my inventory for the whole year in January. So I, I spend $20,000 in January. If I'm looking at my monthly profit and loss in January, it looks like I have this huge loss because I'm just deducting all of my purchases. So it makes the, it can potentially make the books look a little wonky. Whereas if I were using the accrual method for inventory, I'd only be deducting what was sold through every month. So the the cost of goods sold would sort of follow the trend of the sales and it would look a little more even. So like if you convert to an S corp, bookkeeping becomes more important. And then if you're doing better bookkeeping, maybe you want better insights. So you want to do the accrual method for, it just depends. I have, I have clients who do hundreds of thousands of dollars who still use the cash method for inventory and just deduct all because they're like, I don't care. I'm not really tracking the books. That's what that's what you're doing for me. Even though I think they should be, you know, tuned into their books. Um, man, time is flying when you're talking about tax forms. I guess so. It's it's we're all coming up in an hour, so I'll go till the hour, and we'll be done. And maybe we could do this next time. 